all at once, it seems like the industry is talking about game preservation seriously. For better or worse. Since the release of the Xbox One and PlayStation 4, there's been a huge influx of re-releases. The cynical take on this is that in the time it's taken publishers to finish building their new games, they've realized how much money they can make reselling their old ones at almost full price. And it's true, they have. The remastered definitive collection for Game X is something we've been aggressively acquainted with over the past year, even more so than ever before. But if you look a little bit closer, there's something really cool happening. Independent developers are also porting their games to the new platforms at almost full price. And aside from the monetary benefits of having your game available on a system with less overall competition, why wouldn't you bring your game to the latest machine? After pouring two or three years into a project, wouldn't you want it to stay relevant? Stay available? Over the past few years, the term indie has become less and less applicable. Now games of all shapes and sizes are being made by individuals and mammoth corporations alike. Still, the burning desire to have your art viewed by as many people as possible is a very indie sentiment. Flashback to Napster when fledgling bands were just happy that people were listening to their music and enjoying it. There's something just very sincere about Rogue Legacy, The Swapper, Thomas Was Alone, and Home, etc. coming to the PlayStation 4. Smaller developers just aren't beholden to long archaic press cycles and promotions. These games didn't need to be the series that changed gaming forever to properly transition to new machines. They just quite simply needed to continue being good games. Even the big little teams seemed to get it. Telltale's The Walking Dead Season 1 and 2 both came out quite quickly to the new platforms. They didn't wait for Season 3 to be around the corner so they could build a campaign around catching up on an award-winning series. Double Fine also seems to rush its games out to iOS and other platforms so that more people can enjoy them. And I think that's great. Now that the components inside of a home console look so much like a PC, it seems crazy that a developer or publisher wouldn't bring as many of their games to the new platforms as possible. And you know what? A developer who isn't needs to get their act together quickly, because whether it's Valve, Amazon, Apple, or Sony, someone is going to make an earnest attempt in the coming years to launch the Netflix of video games. I'm a big proponent of the documentation of video games, and for the moment I think all of this sounds great. If a company or publisher wants to come at preservation from the same angle as the Criterion Collection, then bring it on. We need a reflexive list of important games, and I don't think anyone has a problem paying money back to the people who made them. For now, the pricing is a bit wonky, but over time, as brand new games start to be released more frequently, charging full price for an old game won't make as much sense. That being said, preservation of any kind needs to be a two-way street. So, when the ESA says something asinine, like, all hacking is, quote, associated with piracy, end quote, and therefore preserving abandoned games through private servers or in museums should be illegal, as they did last week, we have every right to be outraged. Regardless of whether you want to color the terminology as reverse engineering or as hacking, Preserving a video game that is no longer available through traditional channels is an admirable cause. It should be obvious on its face. Preserving culture is a positive force. It's baffling that this needs to be stated, but surprise, when you're opposing museums, the libraries of art, you're probably the bad guys. The ESA is telling the same customers who purchase video games, ensuring its financial prosperity, that safeguarding abandoned ones is a punishable offense. This approach is anti-consumer, anti-history, and ultimately just anti-video games. I love that older games are suddenly the source of so much conversation. It speaks to the legitimacy of our medium, of how far we've come and where we're going. We're finally at a point where referencing the granular details of older games speaks volumes about the design of newer ones, and at a stage where academically charting tropes and genres makes sense. Each and every game on our tapestry brings it to life. Games are worth cherishing. They need to be celebrated, not condemned. We'll have some more thoughts on older games in the coming weeks, so stay tuned. Thank you all so, so much for listening, and if you really enjoy our essays, you might want to consider sending a donation our way. There's a link in the show notes, or you can visit castlecouch.com and click on the green donate button on the right-hand side. Keep talking about games, they're the best. <laughs>